Hello, everybody. Welcome to our panel discussion today. Um, I'm going to go on a little intro here while more and more people start to join us a few minutes after the hour, and then we'll get into it. So it is with great pleasure that I'm going to introduce this panel discussion on a topic that has become the epicenter of innovation in the medical field. And that, of course, is artificial intelligence. We've gathered an expert panel of medical device designers, developers, and strategists to delve into the profound implications of AI and medical device. Every day, we're learning new ways that AI can be used and is being used. So this is very much a discussion without a conclusion, but it is worth having. My name is Andrew. I'm the Director of Marketing Communications at Dell, and Dell is a multidisciplinary product innovation company. Uh, we help our clients bring their bold ideas to market through our advanced expertise in strategy, design, and engineering. And medical device product development consulting makes up the bulk of our work, and it has for the roughly 55, 60 years that we have been in business. I'm joined today by two of my colleagues and an outsider, well, actually an insider, Tom Yen. So let's do a quick little round of introductions, starting with Tom. Tom, who are you? Why are you here? Thank you, Andrew. Um, yes, I would call myself an insider since I'm very familiar with Delve, having worked with them quite a lot. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Yen. Um, I'm currently the Senior Manager of User Experience Design at BD um, IDS, um, Integrated Diagnostic Solutions uh, Division in the Baltimore area. Um, in my prior uh, job, I was the Manager of Human Factors and Usability for a med device company that developed a wearable cardiac defibrillator. Then prior to that, over 20 years um, at the University of Wisconsin, uh, doing uh, research and teaching in the uh, biomedical engineering and industrial engineering departments, where I was also the uh, uh, technical director for the University of Wisconsin Internet of Things lab where that's where I develop appreciation for analytics, informatics, and um, ultimately the leading to uh, AI and how uh, data is used uh, in many different aspects. So uh, thank you for the invitation to join this panel. Yeah, and Tom, where are you coming from us to uh, today? Where are you at? Uh, yet I typically don't wear a suit and a tie, but today I'm actually at the DMI conference um, on the John Hopkins campus in Baltimore, uh, their diversity and design conference today. So um, I'll be giving a talk on uh, improving healthcare using U UXD tomorrow afternoon. Perfect. Yeah, great to have you here and look good, feel good, do good is a motto I live by. So looking yes. sharp. Uh, then let's go with Ken. Hi, everybody. My name is Ken Saliva, and I'm the Senior Director of Interaction Design for Delve. I'm based out of our Madison, Wisconsin studio, and I have the pleasure of leading a team of talented designers who work with our client partners like Tom to design digital products and services. Everything from digital devices like medical devices to the companion mobile, web, and desktop software applications. And I have a shared connection with Tom through the University of Wisconsin. I actually taught an introductory user experience course there for two semesters. Really excited to have this conversation with Tom and Rahul today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ken. Yes, hello, Rahul. everybody. My name is Rahul Kamath. I am a senior design researcher here at Delve. Uh, I work on a lot of different things, but uh, one of the things that I work on are the uh, medical devices and the healthcare future. And I spend a lot of my time thinking about that and where that is going and trying to make that go where it should go. So I'm very happy to be here to talk with everyone. Thank you. Yeah, great. Um, so just before we get into the questions, a little housekeeping, this is being recorded. So if you want to reference it later, it will be sent out to all attendees. 
and uh, it will also live on the internet and you'll also get a link to that in case you want to share it with any of your colleagues who could not attend today. There is a chat, so if you have comments, thoughts, uh, please put it in there. There are also little emoji buttons, and please get wild with those if you feel moved. And last but not least, there is a Q&A section. If you have questions for any of our panelists, uh, please put them in there. I'll do my best to peek at it every now and then throughout our presentation today and ask those questions. Uh, if we don't get to it during the discussion itself, um, we will get to it afterward. So I imagine we'll have about 25, 30 minutes uh, with some questions that were submitted ahead of time. And then uh, whatever is remaining, we'll use for Q&A. So without further ado, let's get into it. Um, and we'll start with Ken. So let's talk about the landscape of medical devices and AI today. What types of devices are we seeing most often? Great question. The, the reality is that AI has been used in medical device development for quite some time, well over a decade in the area of medical imaging. So I would say that's the most prominent use if we're talking about devices, um, some examples of that are ultrasound where AI is used to improve image quality. It can be used to detect and flag abnormalities in images, can even be used to track the progression of tumors or other anomalies so that the radiologist who's reviewing those images can focus on providing their clinical opinion instead of doing all the legwork to register and align images so that those different progression measurements can be taken. And then in real time, AI is being used in ultrasound and other imaging modalities to measure the size of organs or the flow of blood. And then you could imagine that something that we're seeing more recently with the advent of computer vision in medical devices is kind of the inverse of that. So if all those applications with medical imaging are about providing an image and letting the AI toolkit do some analysis to reduce the legwork of the healthcare provider, computer vision is also being applied to the real-time processing of images to do things like count surgical tools or sponges that are being used during a um, surgical procedure so that some of the guesswork is taken out of the equation and that the healthcare providers can focus on their tasks while performing a surgical procedure. Yeah. And, and Tom, from your, your perch at BD, what, what are you seeing today on the market? Um, and also just kind of your, your hunches as to how we might expect that to change in the future. Well, um, certainly at IDS, right, we, we have a strong background in automation of, you know, medical diagnostic uh, processes. So, you know, automation uh, in the general sense is sort of a, a physical process, but I like to think that AI could be thought of as a cognitive automation. So really it provides a method in which uh, input or capture of data, um, you know, data processing, data filtering, you know, all those processes help with what we call, you know, decision support. You know, all this inf information is coming in, but that's a lot of information for a person to try to process. So you try to do this type of cognitive uh, um, automation where it does a certain type of filtering where um, uh, the data that doesn't require a human to pay attention to can be sort of left off the plate of the human that's doing the processing. Um, so, you know, when a person, a human is needed, they're part of that um, uh, workflow and they don't have to worry about the other. I think, you know, this, this gives a perfect example, you know, um, BD just had a new product that was approved that uh, like what Ken was describing in terms of image processing, right? It's, it's not radiological data, but we're looking at cell growth on a Petri dish. And every single Petri dish uh, in the past needed to be looked at. 
well, you know, we can use AI to look at the Petri dish. And if it doesn't have the appropriate uh, cell growth or a certain cell growth pattern, then it's considered negative and a human technician would need to look at it. So only those with the right characteristic of cell growth then is passed on to a person to spend time to look at it, right? So, you know, um, elimination of uh, work that isn't as important in front of a human. And then, you know, example for our COVID test, we actually had a uh, COVID test where um, at home, you know, once you're done, you see the stripes, if you're not, you know, you take a picture of it and the algorithm within the camera will read the lines for you and give you an objective um, uh, interpretation of your result instead of you having to do it yourself. Um, and I think, you know, the, the cognitive auto, um, automation really lends itself uh, to a great deal of uh, processing. Um, just to give you an example that, um, you know, Enzo Data is a actually a, a uh, medical software company, a med tech company in, in Madison, where back in uh, 2017, um, they created an algorithm that would process sleep data to help diagnose sleep disorders. Um, if, if you follow them on um, LinkedIn, they just recently posted that they processed their one millionth patient. Um, let me see here. And with uh, over 576 years worth of sleep data and 36 years of dream information. Now, how many years is that? Uh, 2017, you know, in six years or so, um, you, could, you couldn't have all the sleep specialists in the world look through all that data and, and, and get through it. But this just gives you an example of how the ability to implement this cognitive automation can really benefit a great deal in terms of the, the data processing that's available. Um, I think right now we're not quite there yet, or certainly um, medical device companies aren't willing to, to go through the regulatory process, but ultimately going from decision support to actually decision making, can we actually have AI make um, a diagnostic call on the results without having an actual uh, human physician or a doctor do that? Okay, we'll, we'll be interested to see whether that's a pursuit of medical device companies willing to go through and what the regulatory agencies are willing to look at. But I, I think it's important to understand that the data that's available, you know, that AI uses, uh, you know, may not always be the best data. So can we get to good data set? When, when there's a good data set, right, unbiased data set, I think the outcomes could be quite good. So I, I, I see there's a great deal that AI is providing right now um, in a couple of examples that I gave, but I think uh, there's still a bit more to go before we get to a point where you know, we can totally take the human out of the loop. Yeah, and I wanna get into uh, some of those questions around data and, and biases kind of toward the, toward the end of the discussion today. Um, but really want to zero in on, on user needs. So what what user needs do you think, Tom, um, are, are able to be addressed by AI, the most promising? Uh, I think the, uh, the couple of examples I already gave in terms of the current implementations is cognitive automation, I think goes a long ways. Uh, cognitive automation uh, in and of itself helps a great deal with workflow simplification. Right. There's just a lot of work for a technician, a healthcare provider to have to do. If we can eliminate um, the person from having to do it, or at least simplify it to the, to the point where they don't have to spend a lot of time on it, I think that's extremely important. Right. And, and I think you're seeing that with a lot of the uh, text to speech recognition, right? The medical uh, uh, record keeping. Now you don't have to have a doctor or a transcriptionist to sit there and uh, listen to the conversation and type it back into the uh, EHR. You know, it could be done on the fly. So the healthcare professional can spend more really true interactive face-to-face -face time with, with the patient. Um, and I, I think regardless of the implementation of the AI, you know, it needs to have a seamless integration right, into whether you want to call it a natural or the preferred workflow, um, and within the use environment in which it should be best used. Um, you know, 
voice recognition in and of itself is good, but if you're in a noisy environment, that's probably not a good environment in which to implement that. But you know, uh, information and data capture um, almost is a, a very natural way of communicating. Um, but you know, you have to think about what that use uh, case needs to be. And I think one of the things that um, I think needs to be done in a better way is sort of the overall integration of um, all the sources of the data. You know, we have our smartwatches, a lot of uh, activity tracking, you know, how do we get that, that type of information to be combined with all our other medical data in a manner that our, our healthcare professionals can use to help um, do diagnosis for ourselves, right? So, you know, the, our location, um, you know, uh, really all the IoT type data that could be con uh, collected and then integrated together. I think that's that's another area which I think is important to get. This is, you know, the way the users sort of want to. They don't want to think anything beyond what they're already doing now. So if you can provide it in a manner in which they don't need to change anything, I think that that would be an ideal way. Right. And, you know, the user is, is always at the center of everything that we do here at Dell, but especially I'm curious about the makers, you know, the designers and the developers. How are we going to be using AI in the development of medical devices? Um, we've done a lot of thinking about that here at Dell and Tom, I'm, I'm sure you have as well. I want to hear from Ken and Rahul, you know, what role are we imagining that AI will play in the future of med device design and development? So I, I will take a first crack at that. Um, so I'll echo a lot of what Tom said about, you know, I think we're initially on the front end of this curve um, of, of this kind of coming into medical devices. I think it's really going to be um, where it can really help us is in these very repetitive, very resource intensive, very cognitively demanding um, and or error prone processes that you know, we tend to repeat over and over. Um, and I think th that is where I, I see it being most valuable. And, you know, I, th I think Tom mentioned like um, reading documents or like extracting information or doing any of these kind of things that um, that we would typically do in the process of developing uh, a product or a process, um, but which is very demanding of, uh, of time and resources. Um, I think that's where it's going to really help us get to the finish line faster. To build on that, I just want to give a shout out to Rahul. He collected 19 different uses for AI in product development in an article on the Delve website. And I know that Andrew will share the link to that out ap after we're done here, but I would encourage you to take a look at that. You know, so some of the other ways from a, um, you know, interaction design perspective where we see the use of AI in our toolkit, software interfaces are often, um, the vehicle through which data and information is presented to healthcare providers. So um, we're we're starting to see the large language models improve, like ChatGPT, to the point where they can generate a lot of text that is of high quality. So we've got people using AI as a collaborator or a sounding board, where as we're thinking about, you know, what type of text or call to action or instruction should be presented to users of any software system that we're designing could easily see how some of those AI tools could be a writing partner for that type of um, UI copy. Um, additionally, in terms of generative AI, you know, obviously there are a lot of options out there that are emerging each day and each week to produce imagery. And if we think about how that might impact the design of hardware and software. You could easily imagine how rapidly iterating through divergent concepts, whether you're an industrial designer or an interaction or a UX UI designer could be made more efficient and help you explore options that you had not previously considered. You'll be able to provide images as input, ask your AI collaborator to merge them or remix them to see what different combinations or ideas um, can be generated more algorithmically than what a person might consider doing. Um, obviously, it's going to take a human designer who's skilled and knows how to edit to 
take those outputs and then take them to the next step with refinement, changing the prompts that you put in to get better outputs, but already starting to experiment with that a bit in our work at Delve. Um, lastly, you know, I think about the opportunity for AI in product development. And it's, it's clear to me that some of this cognitive automation that Tom was just speaking about is going to change the way that people interact with hardware and software in a clinical environment. So today, there is a lot of manual effort that's required to document what's happening um, with a patient, whether it's a visit or a surgical procedure. And once those tasks are performed by AI, it frees up opportunity for the healthcare providers to be focused on the quality of care, um, making sure that they and their patient are safe and comfortable during the procedure. So I think we might even see a new category of products emerge that are, you know, addressing the, the kind of new future that we're going into where the rote and routine tasks of documentation and um, manual workflow are no longer a requirement of the human involved in the process. And now we can start to think about how to make them um, more efficient or effective in their roles. It might be, um, you know, thinking about a surgical procedure, for example, you know, a surgeon has certain preferences and um, they might like to listen to certain music during a surgery. They might prefer certain tools or instruments of different sizes or with different properties. And if the, AI systems that are in place and supporting these procedures can learn from the preferences of those individuals and might create opportunities for new types of personalization and customization. And I imagine that design teams will start thinking about those things when they're defining their next generation of products. While we wait for Andrew to come back, you know, I'd like to continue on with um, sort of what Ken has uh, mentioned in terms of that user interaction um, where you know, if you think about it, you know, what is the way that we really want a user wants to interact with an AI, with AI? And, you know, the, one of the areas that I've been interested in is called affective computing, right? Is how do you, how do you get uh, AI to understand and in itself communicate, um, you know, emotional uh, intelligence, right? So it's AI with EQ, if you want to think of it that way, where, um, uh, the way we interact, you want the AI to be able to understand sort of the emotional state in which the user is in, right, as a way to accommodate. And um, same way in terms of how the AI is communicating back to the user, right? Is, is, it, is it done in a manner that um, is communicate, communicating the, the information accurately in a non-biased manner? But at the same time, you know, with the appropriate EQ that, um, person potentially under stress or under a state of confusion would better understand that. I think that would be really interesting to see how, you know, we can leverage AI with EQ, right, in the whole scheme of understand what that user, how to uh, um, address the user needs, right, when they interact with, with uh, various products, right, not necessarily just um, medical technology. Tom, I'm curious um, if you were going to talk about, you know, what impact do you think AI is going to have on the medical device industry, you know, in the future? Like, where do you see that going? Like, where, where do you see it, you know, changing the game? I, I think, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, is an extension of the cognitive automation is really, uh, if you want to just call it workflow simplification, you know, related to what you and Ken brought up is, um, by eliminating what the healthcare professional needs to do so they can focus on something more important. But really workflow simplification uh, may be to the extent in which the process is becoming um, so much easier to do that we could have less trained uh, people do it. Maybe even you know, at home based type where the patients themselves would be able to go through that process, right? Maybe even with the aid of the AI guiding them through the process. It, you know, everybody has done a COVID test, right? So everybody's very um, comfortable doing that nasal swab. Um, 
you know, to some general extent, well, you know, we'd be comfortable collecting our own urine. Now, how many people would be comfortable collecting their own blood samples, right? I, I suppose people with diabetes um, would be, but, you know, to the, to the amount in which you need to do a diagnostic test, I think that's something that we would definitely need to explore. But that overall workflow simplification allows so many more people to be comfortable going through that workflow, uh, whether um, less trained people or freeing up the medical professional or even the patient themselves doing it. I, th I think that that's, could be a great deal of uh, a benefit. Related to that, you know, if the um, workflow becomes more efficient, then we might see an increase in throughput. So now these healthcare institutions that are expensive to build and maintain will be able to treat and care for more patients in an equivalent amount of time, which would further, you know, increase their ability to deliver care in places where previously it might not have been commercially viable for them to, you know, in, in install a site or build a, um, a hospital. So it's, it's really interesting to think about what that could mean for the cost of healthcare and the number of patients who can access. That. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. Um, when I think about the healthcare future um, and, and like what would really make it great, um, I think there's four things I would, I would count. One is empowerment, meaning, a patient and doctors kind of know what to do to move forward. Um, access, which would be about you know, being able to afford it, being able to for things to be usable, like kind of covering disability. Um, the third thing would be preventative medicine. And the fourth thing would be precision medicine. And I think all four of those things are things that AI has the potential to help us improve um, substantially. So when I think about the future and where AI fits into the I think those four things are the four areas that we can most expect it to impact and to most um, change the way we do things. Um, and, you know, just to add a little bit more, healthcare is already a very expensive and scarce resource. And I think that's true globally, um, but it's, you know, it's true in, in the U.S. Um, and I do believe that AI has the potential to lower those costs and to improve access for a lot of people. But as we alluded to earlier, there's a pretty substantial regulatory component here that needs to be in place as well, um, which I think we'll be talking about shortly. Um, but I think that's going to be a big part of uh, making this work. Yeah, we'll get to regulatory toward the end. Uh, but before we do, Raul, I, I want to know, what are the, the challenges that medical device companies face when using AI in their development processes. Um, and, and Tom, curious to, for a follow-up from you as well. With yeah, so topics. my concern about AI is that it's, it's somewhat global, which is that, you know, we tend to talk about it as a sort of magic or like an oracle, but the truth is, is that AI is a, it's a process and we know what went into that process. And there's uh, one big part of that process is data and data integrity. Uh, so I really feel like this is a really important part um, of making uh, of, of us getting to where we're going, which is that ensuring that the, there's good quality data, that it has high integrity, that we understand um, that it is valid and that we have validated the kind of outputs that it delivers um, and that we can uh, we can be assured that the kind of clinical uh, advice that it gives is valid. So I do believe that all that kind of stuff is going to have to happen in the background uh, during the process of product creation um, to ensure that it, that products are safe and efficacious. Yeah, and uh, I totally agree with uh, Raul's uh, comments. And I think, you know, um, we often look at the data um, and the way it gets collected is not well understood, right? The last thing you want is a free for all of data, right? Whatever's out on the internet is what all decisions are based on. That's, that's not gonna work for, for medical devices. A well understood um, uh, collection of the data is gonna become part of that validation process, right? That regulatory process. So, you know, it's important then that, um, the ability to use that data on that individual basis, right, for personalized medicine, I, I think 
can go a great deal in um, across the board in terms of of uh, uh, targeting sort of the the type of outcomes we want for the individual patients. But I, I think it's not going to happen on its own. So you're going to need some, whether it's some sort of law or regulation. Um, you know, uh, certainly in the U.S., it's slow to come. But you know, you got a lot of organizations. Um, one in particular, the Coalition for Health AI, has created a nice blueprint that they're calling the trustworthy. AI and healthcare. It's a framework that they're publishing in terms of how how to apply uh, AI in its appropriate manner to, to do proper due diligence in terms of how um, you would use it. Um, and I, I think in 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 the end, right, there's going to be a strong um, social um, impact, right, around the equity and the overall ethics of of the data, right. Um, you know. The, is the data only accessible to certain people or you know is is the data in it of itself you know naturally biased for another group so it's going to provide inaccurate data for another group i think that has to be you know kept uh in check and well understood right and i i i i suspect that the regulatory process is going to go a long way into making sure that 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 is the case yeah let's jump into regulatory tom uh what role do you think regulations should play in AI-enabled medical devices? Well, um, uh, regulatory agencies right now, you know, already uh, do a good job in terms of, you know, um, sort of assessing and making sure the uh, medical device companies uh, prove the safe and effective use, right? And providing documentation on how they go through the testing and the validation of that medical device. Um, but when it comes to AI, it gets a little trickier where, um, you know, how do you validate um, AI, you know, especially the ones that use neural networks um, are uh, 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 stochastic systems, okay, non-deterministic, meaning um, the data that you put in, the order in which it's inputted um, uh, will affect the uh, output, the results. it determines, right? Um, other methods that are more algorithmic um, are deterministic. So a known input will provide a known output. So um, the FDA is really trying to understand how, how to reduce the burden on medical device companies, especially when it comes to use of these more generative AI, you know, with the neural network type. But certainly for now, um, you know, most of the, uh, AI-based medical device products have been approved. Um, if they do use neural networks, they're approved in what they call a, a locked mode, where it it's learned, and now it's going to stop learning. It's not going to continuously learn. So, a known set of inputs can pro- provide a known set of outputs. Uh, FDA is trying to uh, has provided sort of a framework and is asking for feedback right now from a medical device company in terms of what is the best mechanism to sort of open it up a little more where you have AI that now continues to learn and what would be the process to validate that. You, you can imagine that if you continue to let the algorithms learn, the outputs are going to be difficult to determine, right? So there has to be a process to be able to validate that. And I think um, that is really what certainly the FDA wants to understand, but across the board, right? Any regulatory agency has to know um, for a known input a known outcome. Otherwise, you know, you're going to have medical products that may morph into very dangerous products, even though they were initially approved to be safe. Yeah. And one question we got in via our LinkedIn was about, you know, how do you introduce accountability into an AI tool um, to assure safety for all? We were kind of chatting about this before we, we went live today. Um, there's a couple of different ways of looking at this question. So, Ken, if we could start with you, what what do you think, and how would you, um, what what perspective do you have on that question? Yeah. So one one way to look at it is, what does the AI tool or feature need to do in order to disclose itself to any end user, so that when they're viewing 
data or patterns that have been detected or suggested by the AI, is it clear to them where that information is coming from, that it is just a suggestion and not a diagnosis? Um, I think of an analog here. If I'm, if I'm watching Netflix or some other video streaming service and it's recommending what film or television series I should watch next and it's providing a percentage match. This is a 97% match. We think because you watch these things that you're going to like these things. That is Netflix doing a good job of disclosing the underlying algorithm or artificial intelligence that's powering that system. I would similarly expect that someone who's designing a system that's going to support clinical decision making to disclose equivalent information. So if I'm a radiologist and I'm looking at images of a patient and I'm trying to determine whether or not that patient has breast cancer, I would expect that the ultrasound system would disclose that this pattern that is being detected through the use of AI is derived from inputs of other, you know, patients with breast cancer versus just all of the images that are out there and can be scraped on the internet. And then when it presents a 97% match, I can better trust that the AI inputs were providing an appropriate output. So that's one way that the designers of these systems can build in accountability to earn the trust of end users, especially clinicians. Yeah. And so we actually got a question in the Q&A um, from Jenny, and she touches on trust as well. Are there any barriers to trust elements between a human and AI? And I think the, the important question is, what can be incorporated within interaction and design to foster that trust? Um, so Ken, you kind of med mentioned disclosures. Um, yeah. Curious for, you know, Tom, if you have any thoughts as well. Yeah, trust is something that is earned, right? And usually happens over time. Even a, um, a medical professional with a good reputation and until you've actually interacted with that, that person face-to-face um, -face and your sort of interaction helps you gain a, a more direct, you know, sort of emotional connection that that trust just can't happen without that type of interaction. So can we can we get that type of trust from a technology? Um, again, I suppose over time and related to how Ken described, you know, general disclosure on how information and decision um, is used and made. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm thinking that sort of that the coalition um, in terms of creating trustworthy um, is trying to create a framework in which, um, you know, ultimately uh, metrics, scoring, and ratings um, will provide some basis in which a person can make a, a judgment of the trustworthiness of of the AI or the technology in which uh, they want to interact with. So it's it's. It's not a direct answer, but I think it's it's not going to be something that we're going to be able to know right away that oh that's it. Um, so it's it's going to be a process, right? It's how we develop our own um, trust in someone, right? In terms of uh, needing that type of interaction over time, you know, that consistency of uh, the the uh, feedback that we get. And I, I just want to chime in that yeah, this trust yeah. component is really important, right? Like I think. In general, our trust in things as a society is kind of in decline. Um, but like, this is very important. Um, and you know, one of the things that I think, you know, when I think about going to a doctor, right? Like, I, I think our medical model in our society tends to be very um, rooted in, like, you know, does this doctor know their specialty? Um, but that empathy and that trust component is actually, I think, we learned um, that it is a very important part of outcomes. So I think getting this piece right is actually going to be really important, um, perhaps more important than we might, you know, in our minds think. Yeah, and I I like to add, you know, one aspect, you know, um, if you if you look at sort of the framework that the FDA is trying to use in terms of, you know, this generative AI, 
um, it, it has three uh, sort of categories that it's using the, the performance, right? It would be the clinical or the analytical performance. Um, the second is the input, you know, how, how is the input being provided? Um, is it coming from an algorithm or some other uh, medical device input, right? Um, heart rate and so on. Um, but I think what's interesting is the third, where is is general called intended use. Um, that's a way where a medical device company, given the data that they use, say uh, the intended use of this product is limited for this purpose. Now, if your da data in and of itself is sort of biased for, let's just say the, the, the white Caucasian population, well, your intended use is going to be that. So that in and of itself then prevents people of color being able to use that medical device uh, safely, right? Because their data is not validated for that, even though it can be a um, regulatory approved product. So, you know, you have these metrics that uh, could get approved products, but you really need to understand that what is the intended use, the intended uh, patient population in which that device needs to be used for. And there in and of itself could lead to sort of some inherent biases <laughs> in terms of the, 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 the usability of the product across the uh, uh, global and general population. Yeah. So I'm going to make a big assumption. Assuming that we get this right, I am curious to know, you know, what are you most excited about for this an AI enabled med tech future. Um, and we can just kind of close it up and then just go around the horn. So let's, let's start with uh, Rahul. Yeah, so as say. I mentioned earlier, I do think that the future of healthcare is kind of defined by four components, empowerment, access, prevention, and uh, precision medicine. And I think AI is gonna be really helpful for all four of those things. Um, so I'm, what I'm really excited about is a healthcare system that frankly works. Um, I think the truth is for a lot of people, it doesn't work right now. And um, what AI hopes to do is to get us better results for cheaper, faster, um, while empowering people. Um, and so what I really hope for is that this works the way um, it could. Now, I do think that there's a lot of things uh, that need to be done properly on the front end in order to do that. And I do think that regulatory piece is going to be really important and is honestly at this moment not really talked about enough in my opinion um which is understandable because the um the the future that this uh presents does look so attractive and and so um um it looks so, so much like what we want out of healthcare so i do think there's some blocks that we need to get over on the front end but i'm really excited that um, this will take us to a place where people can get better results cheaper and faster and um, just be able to rely better uh, on our healthcare system to give them what they need. Yeah, thanks. Ken? Yeah, when I think about some of the things that I've personally observed over the years while designing medical devices and participating in research with healthcare providers, they're always excited about leveraging technology and incorporating new products into their workflow if it doesn't require that they spend time or attention in order to do so. They're looking for ways to free up their time and attention so that they can focus it or refocus it on the patient for whom they're providing care. So when I think about what would be exciting about the use of AI in the future, it's being able to give that attention and focus back to the healthcare providers. So if there's more that can happen to automate workflow steps, reduce the macro physical movements within a clinical environment, reduce the amount of time or manual intervention required to document what happened during a surgical procedure or while providing care for a patient, it really means that all of these people who enter into medicine and healthcare are gonna be able to do the things that they really wanted to do and drew them to that career and profession. And now the tools are gonna to automate some of the things that really make the work tedious. So just to give some specific examples, building on things that we've talked about here during this panel, if we think about um, computer vision, for example, 
if that continues to advance, then the reality is that gestural interfaces will become more viable in clinical environments. We've used the, you know, Nintendo Wii and maybe the Microsoft Connect, so we know that gestural user interfaces exist in more tightly controlled environments. But imagine bringing those technologies or bringing more of them to these environments where there is a lot of chaos. There's lots of people moving, lots of things moving, different, you know, lighting factors that need to be considered. If some of those technologies can improve through more advanced computer vision, a healthcare provider may be able to interact with a device that's sitting on the other side of the patient's room or the OR without having to physically approach it. And similarly, building on some of the things that Tom was talking about, there's a fair amount of bias right now that's baked into voice user interfaces because most of them have been optimized for people with what I call the um, television Midwest accent of English, not the other languages and accents and dialects that are used by people around the world. So imagine a world in the future where it doesn't matter what language you speak or what your voice sounds like, but the systems that you're interacting with and controlling via your voice actually understand you. So if natural language processing can continue to improve with better inputs and these neural networks, then it really will reduce a lot of the friction that people experience today when they're trying to adopt these new technologies or tools in their clinical work. Yeah, and I I totally agree with Raul's and Ken's comments in terms of what is exciting about what AI can bring to a med tech and healthcare. Um, and ultimately, uh, you know, this workflow simplification, you know, in in sort of a single term will go a long way in into making a lot of things truly uh, better, um, uh, more accessible, if you want to say that. Uh, but again, you know, I'd like to sort of bring sort of a, a note of caution as well, right? Um, you know, like any new technology, uh, um, healthcare and med tech sort of is always late to the game in terms of its implementation. So other industries will have already created um, sort of their implementation of how AI is going to use. What I don't want is then um, med tech and healthcare just um, blindly adopting sort of that implementation for healthcare and uh, medical device implementation, right? You really need to customize it for the specific purpose of that medical technology. And, and you know, uh, not to be selling Dell, but they will be very good at guiding any company in making sure that the proper implementation is there. Because I think that's gonna be very important. Uh, making something that's already made for another industry is just not gonna be the right way to implement it for uh, med tech um, healthcare. Um, and really, AI is going to help greatly um, to healthcare broadly, right? You know, um, finding a cancer cure, cure for many chronic disease states, um, the next version of the pandemic, right? You know, the speed in which we can find um, a solution to that all is, is benefited by the speed in which what AI can provide to us. But at the same time, that same technology that allows us to do all those things very quickly, I hate to use the word, but um, you know, can be weaponized. You can make something that can cure also targeted, right? In terms of what it could do in terms of its negative aspects. Um, so again, you know, I wanna make sure people are aware that um, there's value in what AI can do and much of the same conversations that we had with cloning and so on, you know, you, you have to have, um, certain level of regulatory along with the sort of the social and ethical responsibility that's needed behind that. But in general, there's a great deal of positive that come, come from it, but let's not lose sight of, you know, the caution that we have to keep an eye on, but look forward to uh, the future that AI could provide. And I just want to end that, you know, think of AI is a complement to our human experience, not a replacement. Yeah, I, I actually just want to add on one thing there, which is that the preliminary studies on AI have uh, essentially shown that uh, you know AI by itself or a doctor by itself are not uh, 
as good as both of them together. So I and I believe that that is probably likely to be the case for the foreseeable future. Absolutely. Right. So AI as a complement to the human experience. It's a nice period for the discussion that we had today. Thank you to uh, my esteemed panelists, Ken, Tom, and Rahul for giving us time today and for all of those listening in the wings. Recording of this will be sent out uh, later this evening and we do thank you for your time. Uh, let us know how we did. You feel free to reply to that email with any questions that uh, you didn't get a chance to ask. We would love to keep the conversation going. All right. Hope everyone has a good rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks for joining. Thanks, everyone.